Let's go. Hello. The Good evening. <laughs> So hello everybody and welcome on our tenth meetup, Artem. Yeah, it tenth? it's tenth meetup. Yes, it's yes. Tenth no, meetup. Нет, так правильно сказали, что будет наступление. Уезжайте. Okay, okay. So uh, welcome everybody. Today we have amazing guest John Coleman with amazing topic that me personally I was. I was waiting a long time to to hear John delivering the stock. It's called Hit Delete. Uh, it's gonna be awesome. A uh, couple of words about the initiative. Artem. Yeah, uh, I I was expecting PPTX, but I will show you from from browser. No, okay, 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 okay. Thank you for what you did. Thank you so much. So. Yeah, we want to share some more pictures because maybe Butcher looks like something new, but for now not very new. Now we can see it's civilians also, but it's the buildings. So it's a city center almost of Kyiv, capital of Ukraine. Uh, the street names after the greatest uh, soccer football trainer of Dynamo Kyiv, Valery Albanovsky. It's the uh, first days of invasion. Uh, this is the world largest transport aircraft Maria before and after they came here to help us to to help Ukraine to survive uh, this is a newest uh, uh, trade center nearby flat that I've just bought two years ago for my grandma and thanks God that I've uh, I've pushed her to leave the flat and travel to Germany so now she's in safe place but Maybe if I wasn't so so much pushy, she will stay there. And this is also a city center of Kyiv nearby Lukyanivska station. Absolutely new business center before and after. <sighs> yeah, this is Chernigiv. Just a residential building. People living before and after. This is Bucha. I believe that you've seen a lot of Bucha last days. Before and after. Just a small city, people live in nearby Kyiv. And we don't want to push you to look at too much of these pictures. But that's the reality of average Ukrainians now. And when they say like, you shouldn't uh, use, uh, cancel, cancel politics, cancel policy to Russians, they are not guilty. It's only Putin guilty. We cannot agree with it. Because the only one Putin cannot destroy everything around. They give orders and some people are pushing on on buttons, you know, and they launch missiles, they kill killing people. So it's not one person. And more than 80% of Russian population supporting this politics. And they say that this campaign, as they call our war, should be continued. So they are supporting this. And my, as my wife said, she, she, I, I was a patriot of Ukraine for many years. She said like always, no, you shouldn't choose people or judge people based on their nationality or blah, blah, passport or ID, blah, blah, blah. Now she said, I've never feel such an anger or hate to anyone alive on the earth before. I couldn't live with it anymore. I don't know what to do. So that, that, that's a small, you know, difference, <laughs> like latest increment of what they've created in two sprints, just one month. And that's how we live right now. And because of that, as a two agile coaches uh, from Ukraine, one living in Ukraine still, it's me, and second one is uh, currently in Poland, it's Andrei. We've communicated and decided that we need somehow to contribute, somehow to help these people in this country. And what we know how to do the best is to... Connect people, those people who are the best in their expertise and know how to share this knowledge and wisdom with others. Our guests, our speakers. Thank you so much, John, Roland. And those people who want to develop themselves continuously, not ready to stop where they are and say like, oh, I am already an expert, I am successful one, I don't need to learn something new. And we've created Agile with Ukraine. And also we found the Uniters Foundation Fund, 
uh, helping Ukraine from 2014, and Andrei will tell you more about them because he's in the, in a direct contact with them every day. Yeah, so this is Ukrainian foundation that has been set up right after Maidan to help people and uh, people after Maidan. As you know, more than 100 men were killed in Maidan, but then Russia didn't stop over there. And they ended the Crimea and started the war eight years ago in Donbass. And since that time, the uh, foundation has changed to United Uniters or United Volunteers, and they are cooperating with largest Ukrainian funds as well. So we are all fans of time to market here, right? We we fans of agility. We have we we are fans of. Uh, be, being fast, responsive, adaptive as organizations. So this is the foundation. Maybe you want to share your screen, yeah. my friend. Sorry for interrupting you. Oh, actually, I'm not prepared. Just in case, <laughs> I, I can share it for you if you want. To. Yeah, if you can, if you can, uh, that would be that would be cool. That would be cool. I can do whatever is needed for you, my friend. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Just yeah. So exactly and. This foundation right now uh, is providing a ton of help for Ukraine and Ukrainian army. So uh, I believe one week ago I made um, I made kind of a summary of what has been done during the month. So they delivered more than three three thousand tons of different help to Ukraine, humanitarian help tactical equipment, food, medical items. And this is the foundation that actually delivers a lot, not by themselves, but in cooperation also with other uh, with other foundations. Yeah, just think of the numbers. Actually, now it's higher. It's more than 160 buses and 130 uh, trucks, big trucks of help. Yeah, so... Of course, we're making this initiative to give people the ability in those hard times to still consume knowledge or at least to switch their mind a bit of. But we're also doing it to raise funds to help Ukrainian people. Because you've all seen what happened in Bucha yesterday. Unfortunately, we will discover even more in the next weeks. And this goddamn evil has to be stopped. So, thank you for being here. Let's move right now maybe to uh, more interesting parts and more fun parts. So we're given the mic to John and we, we're here to listen. Yeah, enjoy. And in chat, you have also the information about how to donate. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Andre. And uh, thank you, Artem. And uh, welcome everyone this evening. Um, I'm going to talk about executive agility this evening. It's um, something that's very close to my heart and I'm really into what I would call authentic agility, uh, where people are really going for it. They really do want to not just uh, have a copy and paste set up, but they really want to try to make things better so that your organization is more adaptable to uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, you can follow me on social media and uh, all that kind of stuff. I, I do the daily flow every day, and that's also supporting um, Agile with Ukraine at the moment. And I just want to remind you all as well that uh, this is a fundraising event as well. So um, if you're here and if you're uh, if you're talking to your friends, maybe you could encourage people to donate uh, to the cause because it's a very uh, worthwhile uh, cause. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I happen to be a scrum.org trainer, I happen to be a less friendly scrum trainer and a Kanban trainer. I do a lot of coaching, consulting. I've got two clients at the moment, one in tech and one in non-tech. And one of the things that I do is, you know, I'm working with teams and whether they're using Scrum or Kanban or Design Thinking or Lean UX, whichever approach they're using, they usually find that there's a point at which uh, they hit their limits. 
and uh, frustration uh, builds. It's also known as delta stress, where it's almost like a victim state where you actually develop a lot of agility as much as you can within your team or your team of teams, but there's, there's a kind of a ceiling that you hit. And while there are lots of solutions in the market for uh, synchronizing teams or for teams working together and people working together and middle management and all that kind of stuff, uh, what seems to be a little bit lacking at the moment is executive agility to uh, to basically underpin authentic, sustainable organizational agility. Uh, just in terms of the style of this uh, talk, um, I'd encourage you to interrupt me uh, during the sessions, really informal. So if you have something that you want to ask me or a comment that you want to uh, just come straight in, I won't be keeping a close eye on the chat window. So it's probably better if you just speak up. Uh, but Andrea or Artem, if you do happen to notice people maybe putting something on the chat window that I didn't notice, maybe you just bring that to my attention and I'll sure I'll be on it straight away. Thank you so much. Um, so one thing I th th about the talk, so the keyboard is the metaphor here. I've got a keyboard in my hand here and every keyboard has a delete button. And the overall spoiler alert for this is instead of adding stuff on all the time so that we can achieve organizational agility. Maybe sometimes we can take things away. Maybe we can take, make things a little bit simpler, uh, one delete at a time. So not necessarily about adding stuff. So you know this yourself, I'm sure from writing articles or writing documents, uh, sometimes less is more. And uh, how can we achieve the same impact uh, with less actually? And uh, uh, less happens to be a pattern as well. So there's a bit of a double entendre there, but not just less, uh, any approach really that allows us to be authentic in terms of how we uh, achieve uh, organizational agility. So let's, let's get started. So there are lots of solutions out there for teams, teams of teams, various different accountabilities and roles not much for executives. And what do we even mean, uh, what do we even mean by executive? Uh, so like it could be, for example, someone who's supporting an executive or actually an executive themselves. We're gonna dig into that uh, shortly. One little health warning is that you might be brilliant. <laughs> uh, I'm not brilliant, uh, but you might be brilliant. You might be very talented, in which case you have skills where you don't need to apply anything that I'm talking about in this uh, talk this evening, where you don't need coping strategies, you don't need crutches, um, you have the intuitive skills or uh, acquired skills to basically go in, have a conversation with an executive and have an immediate impact. Um, if that's the case, you can save yourself a whole lot of time and you can leave the call right now and or you can just maybe uh, heckle and just uh, see if you have a bit of fun during this talk. Um, but do check out some of the thought leaders that I've acknowledged here as, as um, a lot of people, some of these people are in scrum.org, some not in scrum.org, real mixture across uh, the agility sphere, if you like. And I've been inspired by conversations with lots of these uh, people. In terms of what is an executive in the context of this talk, a person or a group appointed and given responsibility to manage the affairs of the organization and maybe the authority to make decisions within some boundaries. And it's maybe a person who owns the strategy or sets the direction of travel and maybe justifies uh, the investment uh, in some product or service. And executives in the context of this talk it could be someone at a CXO level, it could be someone reporting to a CEO, a chairwoman, a board member of a large organization, a regional president of a really big company, a board member of a Fortune 500 organization, could even be a government secretary, uh, maybe a chairwoman of a global nonprofit. You get the idea here. It could be the executive herself, or it could be her minus ones or even somebody who's helping or maybe her coach, someone like that. And what I wanna talk about first of all is uh, what I call the big lie. And in terms of agility, I've got a question for you all. What do you think the big lie is in agility at the moment? You can speak out loud or you can 
put a message on the chat window, whichever, whichever you prefer. Any guesses as to what might be the, the big lie in agility at the moment? It solves all, our, solves all our problems, John. Say that again, Justin. It solves all our problems in one? I don't know. Yeah, it kind of like uh, magic, the belief in magic, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Anyone else? Let's see if there's some messages. We, here. Have, we have some responses in the chat as well. Yeah. Like faster, faster, doing twice the same time, more, more, more. Yeah. Agile uh, is a tool for everything. everything. Yeah. Yeah, there's oh, another one. Rooms. There's another you one can, as well. Yeah, go ahead. That you can be agile at just in just one one uh, thread of the business, right? That you can that your teams can be agile without the business being able to feed them agilely. The good one. Um, yes, maybe. Agile, agile could be implemented fast. You just need a good consultancy firm. <laughs> install the install the uh, DVD. Oh, that's all. I'm showing my age now. You've been talking about DVDs. There's yeah, another plug one. Plug and play. Plug and play. Plug and play. Yeah. There's another one. Any guesses? It's uh, that it's just a practice and methodology. Yeah. That's uh, another one as well. Maybe may, maybe may, maybe is it ag agile is equal Scrum? No. That's another. Yeah. That is the only option on the table. Uh, there's oh, there's a lot of lies, aren't there? <laughs> we, can, um, we can tune it just fine so it would fit nicely. Yeah, um, and yeah, I see that a lot. I feel sad sometimes when I go to some companies and they expect me to put something in that maybe doesn't even fit. Uh, that it's a chaos, that it's only for technology. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Carol. Um, I have another suggestion for you. I think it's you're empowered. Have you ever heard that word? It's uh, it's a really it's, it's abused too, word. Go ahead. Painful. It's too painful. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, one of the organizations I'm talking about it might be too painful. It's like um, you know, we we say you when it's it's like a command and control expression as well, isn't it? I'm giving you power. You know, it's like yeah. You have now a power. <laughs> so yeah, that's one that I perceive at least. I mean, there's lots of other ones. You've come up with some fantastic ones there. We probably write a book about each one of those ones that you just came up with there. And thank you so much for that. And, you know, it's like you're empowered until you're not. You ever notice that? Like uh, you're given the power and then, uh, you know, something goes wrong. It's like uh, the seagull comes in and uh, you're in big, big, big trouble. <laughs> Uh, I hope you know what I mean by a seagull. Seagulls have a habit of kind of flying away and coming back and making a bit of a mess all over you and then kind of going off again. Um, so what I want to talk about, when I talk about deleting here, I, I want to try and get rid of that big lie, if you like. And um, and we had to be careful as well. I, I don't want to give the impression that there are any recipes here or that what I'm going to show you today is linear because life is far more messy than that. It's just that I've noticed some patterns, not just me, but like the other people that I've acknowledged earlier in this talk. And so really, if you see me talking about delete, it's a bit, it's a bit cheeky, really. It's almost like saying you're empowered because <laughs> uh, we can't really delete these things. But I, I think what I mean is, can we have less of those stories? In, you know, instead of entirely getting rid of something, can we have less of those? So when you see me talking about deletion, uh, maybe less of less of those type of stories and maybe more of something a little bit more positive. Okay. And so there's a bit of a coincidence here because a lot of people think, oh, John's gone, John's gone off now and he's he's looking at reinventing organizations or he's looking at spiral dynamics and all these uh, nothing, these colors are a complete coincidence. <laughs> they they have absolutely nothing at all to do with any of those approaches. I just want to put that to bed straight away. Um but there is a kind of a number of stages that I've noticed. Uh, but again, just a reminder, this is not a linear, uh, this is not a linear idea. So the first thing that I've noticed is that we have, we have senior leaders, executives making demands. Uh, they've got fixed price, fixed scope kind of ideas. 
uh, I saw a really brilliant one last year where uh, the minutes of the meetings were delayed, right? So everybody agreed in the meeting what was going to happen next. It was clear, everybody agreed, but there was a little game going on because it's not agreed until the minutes get sent out. And then people plot and scheme in the weeks weeks <laughs> before the me the minutes get released and there 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 you go what was agreed is no longer in the minutes and because it's not in the minutes it wasn't agreed so it's a nice game we can all be nice and we can all agree with each other in a meeting but we uh, we don't actually send out the minutes until much later that's a, that was a, a new one that i spotted in 2021 on picking decisions very similar to delayed minutes i guess um, the leader making the commitment instead of the people uh, who are doing the work. A lack of prioritization, or should I say sequencing of the work, because uh, a lot of senior leaders would say, well, we have prioritized, but they still have more work than the capacity of the organization. So they haven't really, and they haven't really ranked, stacked, ranked what's needed. They're still looking for perfect information uh, when, when they're trying to make decisions. And there's also... Uh, there's also complacency as well in relation to continuous improvement that we don't really need to improve. So these are things that would be at the very kind of base level, if you like, in terms of thinking, in terms of agility. And so what I'm curious about is if you saw these things happening, you know, you know what, what, what could happen? And, and for me, what I've noticed is that when these behaviors are happening, the people and teams actually don't see the point of agility, which is really sad because you get people who really do want to go the right way. Um, sometimes it depends on the person and so on, but I've seen people that are really, really keen, very enthusiastic. They do want to go for it, uh, but they come very, very skeptical because the system is so broken. There's so much uh treacle uh, that 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 word kind of gets confused i don't mean sweet i mean it's so stodgy it's so difficult to do anything it's like it's like we're walking in treacle and people don't see the point of it because they're, they're doing they're doing work within their team but that work then goes to another team to go to the next stage and the people in the next team have different priorities and uh, it's really really difficult and so I'm curious what you do. Um, what would your antidotes, if you saw executives behaving like this, I mean, we, we want them to stop doing this. We want, to, we want this to happen less often, but what suggestions would you have that maybe something they could do instead that would be less toxic for agility, something that would be more healthy for agility? Any suggestions from, from anyone here? Yeah, go ahead. You can just uh, you can just interrupt, uh, Paula. Go ahead. I mean, you need to get alignment, right? You need to you have to have that conversation and that hard conversation with leadership that says, you know, what are what are our what are we trying to achieve? What outcomes are you know? I I we're trying to change that conversation about outcome versus output, right? That we're not yeah. that we are. What are we trying to do? How do we know we've been successful? How do we measure it? And how do we align? so that we can continue to be, be data-driven and continue to make the right decisions and make sure that we're chosen, they continue to choose our product and that we are now their strategic partners and not just a commodity supplier. Thank you, Paula. And it might surprise, surprise you to hear me say that a lot of the things you're saying, I think are really good ideas. What, what I've done in the past is I've made suggestions to executives that weren't really being listened to. And so one of the things that I've had to learn is if the person in front of me isn't listening to me, is there any point in me saying anything right now? What, what can I do right now to nudge them along, to kind of do the next thing, if you like? Because it could be that it's almost like... a. a um, it's like a meeting where people aren't really hearing each other, if that makes sense, uh, Paula. Mm -hmm. But I really like what you're saying there. And, and so some of the suggestions that I've come up with, I'm not saying they're the best suggestions or anything like that, but some of the suggestions that I've come up with 
would be to do with maybe, you know, how about having some immediate minutes? I mean, if the people in the in the climate conferences can do minutes at the end of the conference and they're really very difficult talks, aren't they? If they can do it, surely we can do it. I mean, that's an easy thing to solve, surely. You know, you could have it actually as part of the agenda of your meeting. Can we spend half an hour at the end actually to just agree what the minutes are? Because so we're not messing around for three weeks and that might change the behavior as well uh, in terms of people being more authentic with each other. Uh, maybe we could be looking into the idea of throughput. So when we're looking at uh, the lack of sequencing of the work, for example, and I'm not even talking about goals here at this stage. I mean, literally these people uh, just uh, are trying to figure out how much work they can get done in a year. And so can we have a look at our throughput? How much stuff do we deliver in a given quarter, given month, given year? And are we, are we bringing in less, uh, less work this, this year than we did roughly the same time last year? Because in lots of companies, it's not like a flat profile for the year. There's ple peaks and troughs in terms of what's going on within that organization as well. Like one of the clients I have at the moment, a lot seems to happen in March and April. And then from summertime onwards, it's literally like a decline towards the end of the year. And then it kind of goes crazy again in December. And so looking at not so much, you know, what do we do last year, but what do we do this time last year, whatever our cycle is for the, for the, uh, the industry uh, that we might be in. Maybe just trusting people uh, instead of, you know, leader commits, maybe ask the people, you know, how long they would take. Maybe instead of looking for perfect information, can we try something? Can we just agree to try something? Um, uh, you know, without having to be perfect with that. And instead of maybe being complacent about continuous improvement, um, maybe we can do something simple, like um, instead of pretending that we're all going to spend four hours a week doing learning, like happens in some organizations that like win employee, employer of the year award, not, you know, we allow our people, our staff to learn four hours a week, but then they give their people 80 hours work to do in, the, in a 40 hour week. Well, maybe we just make peace with uh, maybe people uh, don't book first 50, 15 minutes of their day and they do nine minutes and nine learning. They just do a little bit of learning in the morning. And so these would be some simple little suggestions. Paula's suggestions are very, very good as well. Uh, these would be very basic things in terms of, if I'm, if I'm asking people not to do some of these things, what might they do instead? And feel free to interject and if you disagree with anything that I'm saying as well, uh, context is king and all that kind of stuff as well, you know, the usual health warnings. And the next set of deletions, uh, the first one is my favorite, is uh, when, when the old guard get promoted. Have you noticed that where you're making real progress in an organization and uh, the teams are doing really, really well. And next thing, somebody is promoted in from another part of the organization and they're so opposite of agile, it's not funny. And the team actually regresses. And so that's something that needs to be stopped. And this is something that... A lot of people don't even, realize, a lot of organizations don't even realize they're doing it. They don't realize that putting people in very senior positions who have not been demonstrating agile behaviors are actually uh, causing some teams to go backwards. Uh, inflicting help is my favorite one. I, I try not to give help unless people are asking for it. Tom Meller, he, he gave me some advice years ago. He said, John, don't ever give advice unless people are asking for it. But he was giving me advice when he told me that. Uh, but there was some merit in what he was saying there, wasn't there? <laughs> so I try not to mentor or coach or even teach people without permission, actually. Um, so it's almost like a game of patience. Uh, passive risk management is something that a lot of traditional people do. And then in uh, the more agile ways of working, we try to we try to be a bit more proactive, don't we? Instead of the, the leader broadcasting, maybe they could be um, uh, communicating two-way, uh, just uh, listening to people, basically. And I also noticed as well, there's this kind of thing about uh, trying to make people busy uh, and even worse, not even being aware of constraints that there might be in the company, because people call these uh, bottlenecks, where there's there's some part of your value streams uh, that is uh, really the limit of your capacity. Uh, we would have unlimited capacity if we had no bottlenecks, by the way. So there's always, uh, there's almost, I think there's almost always a bottleneck. It might even be the market, right? Uh, another one of 
another favorite of mine as well would be focusing on star performers and this, this kind of thinking that if, if only we had Andre and Artem on that, everything was going to be great because they're a rock star, uh, agile coaches, and everything's going to be great. And that's true. I mean, everything would be wonderful if they were on board. <laughs> Uh, but there's, we've only got two. There's only one each of them, right? So how does that scale? And this is this happens as well. A lot of organizations where they have tiger teams. You know, they these uh, wonderful people who come in. You get to get together and they fix problems. And uh, but we need to make uh, change and continuous improvement just part of the way we work. So this focus on star performers is uh, is kind of reinforcing. Uh, the belief in, in heroes, which is something that we're trying to move away from. And, and of course, delusions of predictability as well. A, a lot of you here are very familiar with complexity. I don't need to spell that out for you, but you'd be amazed how many executives think that the work we're going to do next year is predictable. So if these, if these particular behaviors still existed um, in an organization, my question to you, and you can just speak out loud or you can put it on the chat window, what do you think uh, we'd observe if these things were still happening? I'm curious to hear your view on this. What we would be seeing if these things were still happening? Yeah. We would not be seeing Agile. Right. We would be, we would be, we might be saying we're agile, but we would totally be still working in a waterfall context. Yeah, there's kind of a belief that we can scale out of way of it, out of any problem, that we can outsource our way out of any problem, the kind of a belief in infinite capacity. Um, kind of almost denial, I would say, Paula, that's well well observed. And um, but if we call it agile, it'll be agile, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've even noticed in some companies they're even trying to avoid that word now as well. It's kind of a, it's, it's become a, it's become a problem uh, even talking mm -hmm. using the word. So, yeah. No, I, I don't agree. If you will call a cat for many years, like a, you will call her dog, she will not start barking on you. You know. <laughs> so, if you will call some kind of bullshit, yeah, process, agile, yeah. it doesn't become very adaptive. That's probably more accurate, Artem. We're, we're being a bit we're being a bit tongue in cheek and. And uh, there's, there's a wonderful book, uh, Immunity to Change, and there's an expression in that book. Uh, it's one foot on the brake, one foot on the gas. It's kind of, you know, like the, in America, they say one foot on the gas, don't they? So it's like you want to go forward, but it's like you got the brake on as well. It's like we're, not, we're, neither, we're, we're neither coming or going, as we say in, in Ireland. So we're not really making uh, much progress. Kind of similar to what Paul is saying a while ago as well. We're, we're kind of holding ourselves back a little bit. And so some suggestions to deal with these would be maybe we could uh, foster the idea of uh, recruiting and promoting with agility in mind. So for key hires in the company, that it's, uh, it's uh, and, and this is something I believe that ING did very well, that, uh, well, what I'm told anyway is what they did very well, is that uh, they had a very, they, they had a lot of tolerance for people who weren't really into agility the people who were actually doing the work, but in senior leadership, they had zero tolerance for um, for leaders who were just basically not ready for this new way of being, a uh, new way of acting. And um, and so being more positive about it, maybe we can promote people uh, or recruit people who are demonstrating those behaviors. They're not just saying one thing and doing something else. They really are uh, a living example of agility and action. And maybe instead of inflicting help, maybe we could be listening, really listening. And this is something, you know, I have to remind myself about as well, because often I'm working with teams and if they're using Kanban, for example, and they're looking at their flow analytics and all that kind of stuff. And maybe sometimes I need to check in uh, our flow analytics, the wrong things to be looking at right now, when actually there's a more human thing that needs to happen here, an excess focus on on tools and processes and not really focusing on what's really going on for people. How can we really improve the situation? What's frustrating them? And that's something I should have mentioned in the last uh, step as well. Maybe letting non-experts start the work, which gives us more labor liquidity is an expression that Andy Carmichael uh, said to me before, where uh, by actually having non-experts start the work, the experts are actually more available to help more people. And, as something they kind of do nicely and less large-scale scrum. They have this mentor 
uh, type, uh, well, I don't want to call it a role, but kind of a mentor type people where uh, probably people in teams uh, where people start work that they're not really comfortable with, but they can, they will try to, to do the work as best they can, but they can always call in a mentor if they're really stuck and get some, hopefully get some answers. And Artem, I believe you're a less coach, so you know more about that than, than I do. Um, maybe also getting informed on complexity as well. Uh, I'm not saying uh, you have to, you know, swallow a Kenevan pill or anything like that, but maybe whichever complexity approach, whichever way you find it easier to explain complexity where, where there's more unknown than known and that actually it's really smoke and mirrors when we do any forecast, including probabilistic forecasting, by the way. Uh, I love the, I usually add a little sentence when I communicate a forecast saying 85% will be done by that date. That means 50% it won't be done by that date, but I'll give you a better forecast next week. In other words, what I've just shown you is wrong. <laughs> it's kind of nice get out of jail card, all calculated, but uh, yeah. Go ahead, Artem. I, I, I am a big fan of a principle of Toretto, you know, 80, 20. Yeah. Uh, towards software development. So like 80% yeah. of your engineers in your team have all their 80% of their tasks in 80% done state, 80% moment of time, you will ask them. And if you cannot use mathematics or arithmetic to count, it looks like not so bad. But if you can multiply, the result will disappoint you definitely. Yeah. And that reminds me of another 80-20, the more positive one, which is, you know, getting 80% of the outcomes from 20% of the outputs. But I haven't even mentioned that here yet because at this stage, the executive is still in output land. They're still thinking about delivering projects and widgets, and they're not even talking to the customer. Uh, if they do talk to the customer, it's like a big, exciting thing, and they, they over-index that customer visit as though like that customer is a representation of the entire market. Are we still on track? Are we still on time? <laughs> That's with the presentation, or do you mean the question that an executive might ask us? Only about executives. As for presentation, you can use the whole evening. <laughs> Indeed. John, That's the... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, John, your video you did uh, with the chat from Personal Kanban um, on. In Benson, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you have to grid when you're selecting work, I thought that was brilliant. So that's yeah, good. yeah, I love the two. Um, just to fill people in, I, I interviewed Jim Benson recently on a podcast and on YouTube, and he's famous for personal Kanban and lean coffee and also value stream app. He's also got the humane system of humane management. Basically, it's based on obey our rooms, but it's um, a bit more human than that. It focuses on the on the culture and the change as well as you know the work and the people and so on. And uh, he, he was saying that when we were prioritizing a little tip was, uh, you know, you could you could do all the usual, like the, the the different kind of usual approaches that we have, but also based on, on complexity, you know, picking something that's complex or complicated or clear. But he also had one which I really liked was, uh, which was uh, what you love doing and what do you what you kind of hate doing and uh, you know, what are you kind of procrastinating on, kind of avoiding? And a lot of people with Kanban, they, they limit work in progress to a fault so they can avoid the stuff that they don't want to do. But actually, sometimes we need to we need to do that. Do you know what I mean? So there's a nice tip, Justin. Yeah, thanks for reminding us about that. And so, yeah, it's still very basic stuff at this stage. And just a reminder, it's not linear, but I have noticed a pattern that if this kind of stuff is going on uh, and I start talking about 80-20, it's like ships are passing in the night. It's like I'm talking, but nobody's listening. And so uh, I'm trying to get to a stage where people are actually uh, ready to listen to what I have to say. So we've talked about a couple of sets of solutions so far. Next one is kind of getting more into the kind of decentness of agility, I guess. Uh, so local optimization, you know, trying to delete that where uh, we think we can just be agile in one team. I, I love Klaus Leopold's expression, agility is not a team sport, it's an organizational sport. It's a nice little one-liner, isn't it? And I also love uh, P. Maria Thorian's uh, one-liner as well, where she says, uh, telling a flower to grow has limited utility. <laughs> grow, flower, grow. It's, uh, it doesn't really work, does it? We need to kind of create that environment where it's going to happen. And so pushing as well, pushing work. I'm not saying push is uh, always a bad thing. Sometimes it's needed. 
Uh, but remember, deletion means that we're trying to we're trying to have much less stories about this. Short-lived teams is something I find sad. Uh, where we have this we have this belief that we can just spin up uh, teams for particular projects, and we've got unlimited capacity. We just keep up spinning up more teams. And let's say, for example, Carol, you've got a really specialist skill, Carol and Claudio here. The two of you are in a particular team. Actually, the organization can only go as fast as the two of you guys because you are, you are, you've got some key specialist skills, and we haven't been very good at spreading that around. So this belief in spin up teams all over the place, but we're all depending on Claudio and Carol. So it's uh, how does that work? Lack of goal orientation. I haven't even talked about goals yet. And this is the first time I'm mentioning goals. Uh, rootlessness with people. I think it's okay to be rootless with value, but rootless with people. Uh, shouldn't this have been mentioned earlier? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. Will people be listening to me if I mentioned it earlier? I'm not sure. Uh, this is my favorite. A commitment is a guarantee. Uh, so you've committed, so it's a guarantee, right? So if you didn't have these deletions, if this was still happening in the organization, what do you think you'd observe? This is my question to you. What do you think you'd observe, anyone? First hand experience, John. Yeah. Um, let's say a few things. The, the company squeezed people in this situation. You yeah. can obtain good results, but only for a short period of time. Let's say two or three months. After that, people start to leave and not feeling good, not living good, and so on. So this is the first thing that came into my mind. So, and living constantly in an emergency mode. Put it in this way, like with the yeah. consequences <laughs> on people. Yeah, we're, I think at this stage, I. Yeah, we're certainly planting the seed for a lot of what you're saying, Claudio, um, in terms of the seeds for uh, employee dissatisfaction. Uh, we're, they might not be there yet, but uh, we're, we're, we're doing a good job of putting people in that direction uh, with, with, with these. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, actually, the same stuff that was, I believe, in previous slide, the favoritism, the tiger teams, they're going to be promoted this way. Indeed. And also, I would say it's just lacking humanity. So yeah. we, we, we often forget humanity, don't we? We forget that, that, that you know, it's, we're, we've got people. <laughs> it's not just frameworks and, uh, it's, you know, it's people and how people work together. And, and it, it, it almost feels to me like that uh, people are treated like replaceable machine parts or something. It's like uh, we're we're just making widgets. Reinforcers, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the favorite one. Yeah, Andy Carmichael has used to joke with me. He said, "John, you call me a resource, and I'll call you an overhead." <laughs> uh, uh, I like that one. So you know, what would be some potential antidotes for these? So maybe, maybe we could let teams coordinate themselves. Um, some patterns are better at that than others. Um, so some patterns are kind of relying on scrum masters to do the coordination and stuff. And I won't go into what a scrum master does, and what a scrum master does and all that kind of good stuff. But, uh, a lot of the people who are really authentic about agility would be saying, well, shouldn't teams be self-managing and shouldn't they be talking to each other? Uh, and, and maybe we could focus on aging. Uh, so, uh, instead of uh, this is a little thing from Kanban, I guess you don't have to be using Kanban for this, but essentially just if you started something, can you just finish it? Because a lot of the time when we say people are maximizing value, we're really just maximizing potential value. We don't know how valuable it is if we actually get some feedback from the market about how we're doing. So can we just, we, we can use all sorts of rules to prioritize something and sequence it and put it, in, put it in, uh, into the system. But once you start it, just finish it. Um, and uh, kind of a hat tip a little bit to uh, to Marty Kagan, but not so much. Uh, but having teams that, uh, let's put it this way, deliver a slice of cake instead of layers of cake. Uh, they can actually um, 
we can actually get feedback from the market. It's not like we're really six layers removed from the customer. Maybe we can talk to customers and users regularly. How about that? And you know, instead of like uh, just delivering loads of stuff and leaving at the end of our queue to, for someone else to take it away, maybe we can talk to people. And uh, I took this line from uh, uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Ripley. Maybe we can be ruthless with value, but compassionate with people. And maybe we can invite people. This uh, invitation is a, is a real strong thing in large scale scrum, volunteering, all that kind of stuff. Um, so these are some suggestions that I have. It's not just about, but I'm sure you've the, there are other ones as well, I'm sure. So now we're moving on to efficiency. A lot of the time when I work with organizations, the word efficiency, uh, it comes up a lot. And, and I've had to acquire some skills to kind of listen to the music. I don't mean actual music, but kind of the metaphorical music. What's going on? What are people saying? What are how are they behaving? What's really going on here? Is it really just about squeezing more juice out of the teams? Is that really what it's about? You know, you got the beautiful vision on the wall, or it could be a perfection goal or whatever it is, and we got all that cool stuff. But at the end of it all, you're you're smelling, sniffing, listening. And it's really about efficiency rather than effect. There's nothing wrong with efficiency, but for me, like if you want efficiency, isn't that what lean is for? It's like <laughs> uh, agility is also about effectiveness, sustainability, lots of other good things, being adaptive and so on. Um, so maybe we can delete the efficiency tunnel vision and think about, uh, I love that one liner from Russell Lakoff, the more right do you, you do the wrong thing, the wronger you become. And so can, can we, can we kind of, if, can we course correct if, if we're doing the right thing and we get it wrong at least we're still doing the right thing we can we can we can try and improve but if we're doing the wrong thing we're quite, we're kind of in trouble aren't we and i'm not saying big, big bet is a bad thing at all but it may be, but maybe it should have be less often maybe we should be trying to have smaller bets I, I, I imagine imagine you were James Bond or the, the 007 i should say now because the the new 007 is female isn't she and uh, imagine you're a 007 and you go into this casino. I hope that I never go into a casino because they'll take all my money, I was told. But uh, you don't put all your money on the first four tables, do you? You might, you might, uh, you might spread your money around on, on other tables and you might find actually that all the actions on table number nine. And if you did this MVP thing that a lot of people abuse, that uh, you might have put all your money on the first four tables and that's not actually where the action was. Maybe we need to uh, get rid of long-lived impediments. Uh, there was one client I had, and within the same week, it was kind of coincidental because I haven't seen it since, but within the same week, there were two different teams in the building that had an impediment each that was seven years old. Seven years old. And so the teams just thought, this is normal. Like, this is just how crap things are around here. And, you know, someone like me came in and was like, what? It's like, what, what are you talking about? Like this, uh, so basically, they had escalated these problems before to someone in hit headquarters somewhere else um, who metaphorically probably had their feet up on the desk, you know, and pushed it back down to the team saying, you are empowered. And uh, that's like a big lie, isn't it? They, were, they weren't really empowered. They couldn't fix the problem. A decision needed to be made. Also, over milking the cow. Uh, milking the cow is a metaphor I use for maybe uh, trying to milk too much profit out of the product you already have and kind of losing sight of actually maybe we need to be looking at some potential value in some other products. Maybe instead of thinking about scaling, maybe we need to be thinking about simplifying. Nothing wrong with projects. Uh, projects still exist. Uh, but maybe at this stage, we should be thinking about, uh, do we, we need project teams? Can we just feed projects into long-term stable teams? Uh, and maybe instead of uh, initiative budgets, we could be looking at, uh, well, you know, where's the value for our products and, and, and allow us to flex our funding on a quarterly basis or even more frequently. Another one would be the people in the wrong seat on the bus. That's from the, uh, the book, uh, Good to Great. Don't ever write a book, by the way, and say a company is great because one of the bad things about that book is they said some companies were great and they weren't so great in the end. History has told us otherwise, but there was some nice research in there. And that was a nice one-liner. Do, do you have the right people on the bus? And uh, are they in the right seats on the bus? And do you have the right person driving the bus? Um, 
and uh, individual meritocracy as well. Uh, this is a kind of a hint at the previous one as well, the belief in superstars and build it and they will come. Uh, a lot of teams, uh, according to Marty Kagan, even a brilliant product manager, that's his parlance, product management, he says even a brilliant product manager is wrong 70% of the time. Imagine how, how much capacity you could free up by not building stuff that you should never build, maybe by doing discovery or something like that. So I've got a question for you. If this was still happening, if these behaviors were still happening, if we did still have big bets, we were talking about efficiency, we were over milking the cow, we still had project teams, we still had initiative budgets, we still had people in the wrong seats in the bus and all these other things. What do you think you would observe? All gone quiet now. I would I would say something about dependencies. You you cre you you are able to create more and more complex and and dependencies. Yeah. Ecosystem, let's say. I Indeed. have a, a vivid ahead. picture of people saying, you know, shouting as like you're agile and your scrum suck. It, see, it doesn't work. I mean. We tried it, it doesn't work. So we're gonna do it the old way. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that that's uh, very well observed. And, and uh, I refer to this as Delta stress where people have actually made a lot of progress at this stage. You know, where we've actually, we're four stages in here and there's still a fair bit of stress in the system. And you're, you're almost being rewarded with more pain because it's almost like a victim state here. And these, these deletions are really important at this point. Uh, because uh, people might start giving up as well at this stage. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Eliana, for, for that for that one. And so there's an expression, feature factory. Have you heard feature factory before where you're just kind of delivering stuff and um, we're not really sure whether we're making a difference or not. It's uh, it's fine, build it and they'll come. It's it's okay it's uh it's uh, you'll have this denial and when i hear things like uh we've had the best year ever or we've had the best two years ever i get really worried because i know we're heading towards a wall uh because uh that's what happens isn't it before uh before you get disrupted as we've had our best years ever um so always looking for what the next thing might be and so some some possible uh Alternatives, I would say, maybe we could be uh, encouraging compassionate dissent. So dissent is okay, uh, but maybe we can be compassionate about the dissent. We don't have to uh, as, uh, assassinate uh, the people who uh, who have ideas that aren't uh, maybe going to go forward. But maybe we can be uh, compassionate about how we do that. Maybe we can focus on fixing problems. How about that? How about, uh, I love this about the overall retrospective and less, by the way, quite genius what they do. Uh, so every team has their own retrospective and then the overall retrospective, representatives from each team uh, with the scrum master um, and some managers, some senior leaders, talk about some of the stuff that may be beyond the control and influence of the teams. So maybe we can fix some stuff. Because, you know, the teams can do some stuff and don't get me wrong, I say the teams, you know, you, you know, there must be something that you can do, but uh, there's also some stuff that is beyond their control as well, beyond their influence. Maybe more regular funding cycles, maybe self-designing teams, kind of a hat tip there to, hat tip there to Nexus and Less who uh, kind of recommend those things. And maybe when the risk that we can harvest the value is quite high. Maybe we need to do some experimentation. Uh, Ellen Gottestina refers this as discover to deliver. Uh, but that's maybe an oversimplification because discover to deliver might give the impression that just because we do discovery, just because we meet customers and we do experiments, that doesn't necessarily mean that we should build them. In fact, when you discover, you might find those 70% of ideas that you should never build. And, and I think this is a touch of genius actually uh, that, we, we talk often about uh, limiting work in progress, don't we? And you get that for free when you do discovery because you find out most of your ideas you shouldn't do. <laughs> and so how about that? It's like, uh, instead of uh, filling your funnel with stuff um, and maybe getting out of the building uh, much more often. Okay, so let's, let's go on to the next, uh, let's go on to the next set, right? So 
Uh, next set of deletions would be uh, data-less decisions. So someone mentioned earlier on data-driven decisions. Um, in Lean UX, they talk about data-informed decisions. So you, you can have a bit of balance. You talk to customers as well. You don't just get blinded by the data. Um, instead, we talked about 80-20 earlier on. I'm now only mentioning 80-20 at this stage because it's only at this stage where we're thinking about goals and stuff. And, uh, and uh, in, instead of uh, leaders uh, pushing impediments back down to teams, maybe, uh, maybe they're, they're, they've already been resolved. Uh, at this stage as well, we've realized, and we've realized much earlier than this, but now is the time where, <coughs> excuse me, we've realized we're at a ceiling and we need to uh, maybe delete some processes and workflows or simplify some processes and workflows that are actually impeding our agility. Maybe the way we demonstrate compliance, is there a way we can automate uh, uh, our demonstration of compliance? Is there another way that we can demonstrate that we're actually doing things well? Instead of just having maybe a managerial only career path, maybe we can be thinking about a horizontal growth path because if you have set up really good agility, you will still re reach a ceiling because if I'm rewarded for being a HR person one level one, two, three, four, or legal one, two, three, four, or Java developer one, two, three, four, even if my manager is telling me that uh, they'll, I'll get credit for learning extra skills, at the end of the day, if they only care about that particular silo, I will only get rewarded for those. So we need to we need to change the system so that we can actually get rewarded for for growing horizontally, growing additional skills, to the extent where you can actually coach people on those skills, and get really good feedback for people that you do that as well. And this whole idea as well, a better, faster, cheaper, which is really not what agility is all about, but a lot of people uh, think uh, that it is. So if we didn't have these deletions, what do you think? Uh, we would observe if this was still happening. We have data less decisions. We weren't doing eighty twenty impediments. You are empowered, and you know the impediments aren't fixed. What what do you think we'd observe? All oh, very quiet. It helps if I unmute myself. Um, you don't get a lot of incentive to, I mean, if we don't delete at least like the career path stuff, you're not going to have incentive to grow, right? You're not going to, you're not going to be cross, you're not, you're not encouraging cross functionality, right? You're not, um, if the leaders are pushing impediments back down to the teams, then yes, it's good that the team should be should be fixing the problems that they have some control that are in their sphere of influence. Yeah. But if it's outside of their sphere of influence, then that problem's not going to go away, right? You just, we're back to there's churn. It looks like there's work happening, but you know, you're building, but are you building the right thing, right? You don't know. You know, if you're not, you can build the greatest thing in the world, but if nobody wants it, it's like, I've, you know, I've built a better yellow pages. Nobody's using the yellow pages anymore. I've like, built, I've re-indexed this beautiful yellow book, which I guess makes no sense out of the U.S. But, you know, they, the, the phone company used to produce a physical book that you looked things up in. Nobody, nobody looks at businesses in a physical book anymore. So even if you build the better one, you're not building, you know, you're, you're not going to, you're not building anything that has value. Thank you, Paula. And another one as well that I've noticed, uh, kind of topping up what you're saying, Paula, is um, simple little thing, like maybe a colleague sends an email to her boss saying how wonderful the job she did, but she, you don't get copied on it. Simple little behavior like that, where people are taking credit for something that maybe was something was done by more than that person. Um, people essentially still stepping on top of each other. We're supposed to be working together, but the system is still designed for us to be 
uh, working individually and without these deletions that will continue and and so sometimes for example when I train people on Kanban for example and and they do a simulation like Twig or something and we uh, we finish the game and they 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 get the whole idea and then I and I restart the game and I say how about I start all of these items and I, I put everything in and I say everything's got a deadline let's start all of them right now is that a good idea and I said no that's a terrible idea I said that's exactly what you're going to do when you go back to your desk. And that's what people do when they go back to their desk because uh, the system is encouraging them still to do that because, you know, you tell me how I measured and I'll tell you how I behave, you know, and that's, uh, that's still what's happening at this, at this point. So it's, it's much bigger than just agile, isn't it? It's uh, there's a whole set of things that need to happen here. And thank you, Paula, for your, for your intervention there. I really, really appreciate that. And yeah, potential is much more limited than it could be. And so some interventions maybe that we could have, maybe data informed decision making, maybe treat some initiatives as bets. Um, hopefully not very big bets. Uh, maybe uh, not just, uh, we said earlier, how about non-experts uh, starting work? How about um, uh, non-experts doing crucial work? That's the really important work. And how about maybe thinking about descaling processes and flows? So we're, we're getting quite agile at this point. And this is interesting, this step, because for me, uh, a senior leader who's really in the space of agility is thinking more about the future than the past. And there, you, to be a leader in the organization is not necessarily a position. And why am I saying, I mean, this is a almost criminal that we say harming the environment I mean, we're still harming the environment at this stage, but maybe, maybe now that we've sorted a lot of other things out, I mean, it's not completely linear. There's uh, this, you might do this earlier, but maybe this is something we need to be thinking about in terms of the value is not just about customer end user market value, organizational value. Uh, it's not even just about risk in terms of failure demand. It's also maybe about sustainability. And thank you for the reminder as well about the donations as well. So uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll donate and thank you so much for that. And uh, Carl, you mentioned earlier on as well about dependencies, right? We were kind of gone, gone crazy with dependencies. So can we delete dependency management? And how, how do we do that? <laughs> And uh, I want to put targets. Instead of looking at targets, can we can we look at trends? So I'm curious what you think. Um, if we didn't get rid of these, like thinking about the past, uh, having new leader, leadership positions, uh, still having the environment, still doing dependency management, and still having targets, if we didn't delete these, what do you think we would observe? You could do it on the chat window, or you can uh, you can voice it out as well. It would be coordinational chaos, chaos. Yeah, coordination chaos indeed. Same old, same old, Paula. Thank you. Now, perhaps a, a regression if there are org leadership changes. That's a very well observed. Uh, that's a very good comment actually, because uh, and this kind of goes heads a hat tip as well to one of the very earlier slides as well promoting people uh, who uh, weren't in the agile mindset, we have seen uh, many a change being uh, unraveled because the, uh, the order that was finally agile, uh, a new order came in and uh, new people came in and actually unraveled the old, old change because these new leadership positions, uh, people come in that maybe not with the right side because we're quite agile at this point and and we're not working with the people we already have. We're bringing other people in from outside who might not be at the races like we are at the moment. Claudio uh, hinted at this as well earlier. Um, and so uh, I would say at this stage, uh, we're, we're losing customers. And um, we're probably losing customers well before this, but like uh, we're not really, we're kind of, we're kind of, we're delivering value. We have organizational value. We've got some customer value, but we're not quite really at the races um, in terms of uh, what, what, what we, they, they want from us. And so some, some potential 
antidotes would be maybe having goals and multiple and multiple time horizons. Now, when I talk about goals, a lot of you are familiar with complexity and you probably know that goals are suitable for the complicated domain and not so much for the complex domain. Uh, but what I mean here is that if you think of goals in terms of like a sense of direction, where where do we think we're going? And maybe using some evidence-based empiricism to find out if our goals are wrong and if they're wrong that we kind of course correct. Uh, maybe we've got some congruent purpose that makes sense for people. Maybe we have true slice of cake teams and maybe we're looking at trends. And we're getting really into it now. And at this stage, uh, the set of deletions I want to talk about would be the appreciation of ego. So there was a, there was a pattern in the past where you needed to have a really charismatic uh, leader, uh, uh, usually with a very strong ego, uh, in order for the company to move forward. Um, thankfully, we have some examples where that's not no longer the case. Some people might be surprised that I've got backlogs in here. So what, what's going on here? Like, is John going crazy here? Like, what's going on? He wants to delete backlogs? I thought this guy was a scrum trainer. Like, what's, what's going on here? So um, this is a hat tip to John Seddon. He's a famous systems thinker. And John Seddon considers backlog a backlog just another queue. Uh, I, I refer to this as like back to the future. So this has kind of gone beyond less now at this stage. It's kind of like uh, where essentially what you're doing is uh, very simple. It's like back to the future, really. It's like, uh, you know, you deliver something to the customer and then you get some feedback and then you ask her, what, what should we do next? And not building a big long list of things of 100 items that should be in the backlog. We should have been sustainable all along, but I mean, we should finally be giving this the push. We should always be considering a diversity and inclusion. That should be much earlier, but there shouldn't be any hint of this. Uh, it shouldn't be any hint of this. And uh, even the idea of a five-day week, uh, maybe we can be thinking more about it. I've seen some countries experimenting with four-day weeks and stuff like that, really thinking about the employees at this stage. Um, so if we didn't have these deletions, what do you think we would observe? We'd love to be here, of course, but still there's some things that we'd like to get rid of. I'm curious what you think. Someone put a comment in there. Thank you, Artem. If you, if you need to hide a dead body somewhere, just put it in the third listing of your backlog in Jira. Nobody will notice there. Not evolving? Yeah, it's good one, Gloria. Uh, that's a good one. Um, you might lose our best people. Uh, Claudio was hinting at this earlier. We planted the seed much earlier, didn't we? Uh, but uh, we can be really agile and all that kind of cool stuff. But still, after all that progress, uh, we we've we've actually we've lost the plot. We've uh, uh, we 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 didn't we didn't evolve as Laurie said. Poor engagement as well. Thank you, Paula. Toxicity as well. Thank you, uh, Claudia. So some some potential interventions here, maybe an appreciation for compassion. Uh, Craig Larm asked me to read a book once. He said uh, against empathy. I thought it, I thought it was so what a book against empathy. Are you serious? It's like when I read the book, it's actually not bad. <laughs> and uh, the basic idea is that sometimes empathy is corrupt. That we do things for people that we like. And, uh, yeah. you know, and so maybe it's more about compassion. Maybe that's what we really mean. Go ahead, uh, Artem. No, I just want to say that it's quite, quite uh, expected from Craig. <laughs> <laughs> but still, there was a point in the book. It was like, it was, uh, we, a lot of us kind of conflate compassion with empathy. And you can be compassionate with someone that you don't even know. Um, and... Um, Maybe uh, maybe ask the customer what she would like next. Maybe we can be focusing on customer jobs, user jobs, jobs to be done, that type of stuff. You could have done that much earlier, of course. Maybe we could be more authentic as well with our recruitment. It's not just about the big ego guy and so on. So, so these are lots of deletions. And you could have done these in any order that you wanted. But I've just noticed that doing them in this type of an order helps me to make progress. But context is king and so on. Um, the thing is, though, that that's a lot to do. And I'm just wondering that if you didn't do this, 
what happens next. And, and I put it to you that if we don't have these deletions, the executive will probably get deleted. And I, that's not me. I mean, I've not, I've not no control of whether someone gets deleted or not, but there'll be so much pressure on, on the executive that it's likely uh, that they will get deleted. They've got such a short uh, tenure now, haven't they? It's getting shorter and shorter. And so do you want to be, do you want to be part of the, do you want to be part of the, of a new way of being, or do you want to get deleted? And, and, and if the organization continues to put up with the executive, I put it to you that the organization will get deleted. So the basic uh, theme of the talk is delete, delete, delete. You don't delete behaviors. Eventually, bad things will happen. Time doesn't wait for anyone. And uh, yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. John, this is fantastic. Are you able to go back to the previous slide? Sure. So here. Yeah. So is the is your recommendation or where you're coming at it is this kind of a sequential aspect to this? Or what what do you think about an organization obviously that's grappling with a myriad of um deletions right uh, all over the spectrum here yeah. um, in terms of how to prioritize what to yeah. tackle because I think one thing that um, I'm finding is that you may get executive level support and even leaders that are embracing what I'm calling leadership agility um, mm. in the whole approach but without the heavy middle layer without all the complex organizational structures, the interfaces, technology. I mean, it just, it's very, very complex and evolving, right? Even the top line executives can't necessarily move the needle without, or, you know, coordinating, orchestrating. So, so I'm just curious to yeah. see what you yeah. think. Yeah, so it's it's not a sequential approach, but I tell you how I apply this. So let's say, for example, I saw that an executive was doing all sorts of fancy stuff, right? They were setting goals and and uh, meeting customers and all that kind of cool stuff, but they were still not sequencing the work and they were still overloading the teams at work. As far as I would be concerned, the executive is still at the base level of agility because they've got they're missing some of the basics. And so there's a lot of good noise and it sounds brilliant and they do very well on the podcast and all that type of stuff. But actually, in terms of making a difference to the organization, because they haven't got some of the basics right, they're actually undermining some of the progress they're, may, may, uh, they're trying to make. That's how I put it. So it's not sequential. I mean, you, you could do it in a different order. It depends on the context. But one thing, I one heuristic that I have observed is that uh, a lot of us like to like uh, to talk about outcomes, don't we? And goals and direction and all that kind of cool stuff. I observe quite a lot that I'm not pushing an open door with that. It seems very obvious to a lot of us here on this call that focusing on outcomes, uh, changing customer behavior and changing end user behavior and being adaptable, these are all good things. But when I'm talking to executives, I, I'm not necessarily opening, a, uh, pushing an open door with that. In other words, they're still very much entrained in delivering projects, delivering outputs, uh, basically moving faster, uh, stuck in the efficiency uh, uh, bias, if you like. And so what, what right. I do when I'm talking to executives, I'm listening to what they're saying. And I'm, I'm watching how they're behaving. I'm actually much more interested in how they behave because uh, uh, a lot of the time people say one thing and actually do something else. I'm much more interested in how they behave. Uh, and if I, if I observe, for example, that there's a prioritization done for 2022, 2023, but the amount of stuff that's put on the list is two years of work, I know I've got a basic problem with the executive that they still don't understand capacity and they still don't understand basic things like flow dynamics and stuff like that in terms of uh, limits to limits to the capacity of the organization. And so we can do all sorts of fancy stuff like meeting customers and so on, um, but uh, that will struggle. However, there is a, this is why I don't say it's not linear because for example, you could you can short circuit this. 
if you have if you manage to convince an executive to do discovery they will discover that most of the ideas they should never build them and then we kind of we 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 cut through a lot of this and they realize that actually then they can do 80 20 but if you if you have an executive in front of you who doesn't even understand outcomes you have no basis for 80 20 because what are you talking about? What do we, we just need to deliver this project. We we committed to stakeholder X, Y, Z. We deliver this project. We're going to deliver this project. Uh, there's no goals there. There's no uh, outcome orientation. So they've got nothing to say, hang on a second. Is there another way we can achieve this objective? Uh, because they're not thinking in outcomes. That's the way I apply it, Gloria. Does that help? Yeah, that, that's really great because I think you're right. Context is king, right? Um, normally when it's varied, uh, especially if you want to inspire what could look like. I think it's super important to find something that you can actually achieve in the organization. So, you know, it's it's less theory and more tangible. We've done it in our org. Yeah. So when I look at something like this, I'm thinking of, you know, what's something that you can actually, you know, implement and get done and do it well um to build that snowball effect and and that's always different in so many different contexts and organizations so yeah that that was kind of originally what where i was thinking like huh i'm wondering you know what's the sequencing and and i like what you said um in terms of looking at the pain points um obviously if there's no capacity for change which you know if you have too many things to do, right? No matter how much you want to change, you can't, right? So um, I, I appreciated that example. Thank you. I was to leave you a one one liner, Gloria. It would be meet the executive where she is, but don't meet her in the basement. What I mean by that is, uh, it's there is value in meeting people where they are and understanding, and you'll definitely have a more effective conversation with them if you are connecting with them if you understand it by the way we need to be credible we need to build credibility i forgot to mention that at the start and kind of an obvious thing but you need to understand the business you need to understand what they're doing uh because otherwise you'll just come across as all theoretical and so on but if having achieved all of that you that they realize that you know what you're talking about you understand their business and they want you to do stuff that is just so against your values uh, that's what I mean about not meeting them in the basement. Uh, you know, we'll meet you where you are, but if you're in the basement, um, there's other people who can help you in the basement. That's probably not what we want to be doing because uh, I speak for myself here that I, I want to help people with authentic agility. If they think they can buy lean agile in a box, they're they're talking to the wrong person. I'm, I'm the wrong guy to talk to, if that makes sense, Laurie. Thank you. So uh, that's almost it, really, just uh, in terms of uh, more information. If you want to uh, listen to uh, any podcasts, I, I meet very, very interesting people on the Exigility podcast. Uh, Jim Benson was the most recent one. And actually, that was the one I think I enjoyed the most. Uh, I didn't expect I, I knew he was a great guy, Jim, but I just didn't realize how great he was. And uh, I really enjoyed talking to him. And it kind of reminded me of some really old ideas uh, that, you know, a lot of us uh, maybe took for granted, but maybe we could kind of refresh them a little bit. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Um, uh, Heidi Helfand, I believe, will be one of the next episodes uh, about dynamic reteaming. Uh, but there's lots of interesting uh, talks there. So uh, please do check that out. Uh, any other questions um, from anyone? Traditionally, I have only the stupid one. So if anyone has a smart question, I can leave it. Go ahead, Ariana. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I got really, really intrigued because it was the first time that I heard of this, get the right people on the bus. Mm on the right seats on the bus. I briefly Googled it. I think I found the article and I will read it. But yeah. if that's not too much of trouble, could you please? Yeah, it's Jim Collins. Jim Collins. To, um, yeah. Uh, just write it here in the chat window for you. Jim Collins from good to great. And I, I was having a bit of a giggle off the book because uh, it was written before the financial crisis, you know, 2007, 2008. And he was talking about, you know, this is a great company and this is a good company and, you know, this kind of thing. And he had all sorts of research, 
But we found out uh, during the financial crisis which companies weren't so great after all. <laughs> so uh, you take it with a pinch of salt, but there was some nice, there was still some nice theory in there and uh, it's lots of uh, practical stuff as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone oh, else? Can you elaborate? Oh, sorry. Can you elaborate yeah. on your uh, nine minute of learning at uh, 9 a.m.? Yeah. So can you my, my straightforward question would be, if I'm doing the capacity for a team mm. um, and I'm deducting the amount of hours they can do a week, so doing research, whatever, learning, other projects, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. We do, we, what would be like your ideal amount of time you want to set aside? An, an hour a week for one person to just think about stuff genuinely, not related to anything apart from learning? I think that's all we can, I, I think we should make peace with what we can really do. And a lot of the time we kind of say, oh, we're going to do four hours and it doesn't happen. And I'd rather we committed to something that was realistic. And it's really simple to just get everyone in the team to basically mark out of their diary as unavailable the, the very start of the day. If you have your, I don't know, your daily scrum or daily Kanban or whatever it is at quarter past nine, maybe you can spend the first 15 minutes you know, looking, checking out a YouTube video or listening to some podcast or whatever it is, and you can get to the next the rest of the episode tomorrow. And it's just that simple little thing of having a habit in the team of learning something for nine minutes at nine o'clock is you could spend 15 minutes, but it's just kind of nice, easy thing to remember is at nine at nine. And that's inspired by a colleague of myself and Artem, actually, um, who had, he said it in a different way, but this seems to have a nicer ring to it. Um so that's the basic idea, Justin. Uh, and, and that's kind of inspired by some cynical stuff that I've seen in some companies where they they actually say uh, their staff can read a book, they can do whatever they want four hours a week, but then they proceed to treat uh, their people like resources and try to utilize them like their machines and factories. And and then they actually, they never get time to learn actually. They're expected to learn really on their own time. And so this is a nice human thing as well of saying you're actually... You're really setting the culture as well that we we are serious about learning. We do want to learn in this company. It's a simple little thing to do. Okay, thank you. I've got an, I've got another quick question. Unless someone sure. else wants to go first, go ahead, Justin. Um, so I hear this a lot from you. Inflicting help. You know, can I yeah. help you? Can I speak? You know, I know your your definitions of coaching, teaching. You've got a whole little quadrant of how you do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I really want to coach, as in I want to block like a 30-minute lesson per day, maybe after the sprint for the week of a new team. Um, what, what's your, your tips on maybe sign with a new team and you just want to teach just general stuff, to develop scrum values, to how to plan properly, stuff like that? Yeah. So the first thing, Justin, is I have to make sure that people are really listening to me. Because I can say whatever I want. And if people, if I just by observing body language, if I'm noticing that people are just switched off straight away as soon as I open my mouth, I'm, the way, I'm wasting my energy. This is just my own personal style. I'm not saying everyone should do this. This is just what I do. And so, for example, um, if I want, if I feel that the team is going to, going to do something that I think actually maybe they're not aware of a metaphorical open manhole in front of them that they're going to step down a hole and they don't even realize they're going to do it, I might say something as simple like, uh, there's another option here. Do you mind if I just spend 10 minutes just explain this other option? Would that be okay? And I have to say, yeah, I've got permission to teach for 10 minutes. Um, if um, if the team is uh, asking for help on something, then you know they're and they're looking. It's obvious to me they're looking for some kind of an answer. Uh, I'm happy to give them advice if they ask me for. It. But if I just give advice and they haven't asked for that advice, they're they're less receptive to it. What I find more offensive though is, uh, and I do professional coaching myself, but I have noticed a pattern of people who are trained as professional coaches who try to clock up professional coaching hours by treating every conversation as a coaching conversation without having a coaching contract with the person. And I, I, I just pulled on the shutters when people do it to me. I just, it's just an, an immediate defense reaction that I have when people, I feel, people are, are like hacking my brain, you know, they, 
if I if I didn't ask to be coached, I, sh- I shouldn't be coached. So it's a game of patience, Justin, unfortunately. Now, it depends on your personality style as well. Some people, when they walk into a room, they can just own the room and everybody's just listening to everything they say. I'm not one of those people, you know, I'm just not one of those people. I'm not blessed with, those, with that gift, uh, with that talent. Uh, if you are and, and people are just listening to every single word you say and you can do lots of things. For me, I have to play a game of patience, which means that it's annoying sometimes when I can see people doing something in front of me, but I also know it's a waste of energy to give advice to people when actually they haven't asked me for advice. I might say something like, um, I actually, uh, I'm aware of something else here. Do you, do you want, do you want me to uh, give you some advice or are you, are you happy you're doing the right thing here? And if, if they say, yeah, yeah, you give me some advice. I mean, that's okay. A friend of mine had a little trick. It was a bit binary. What he did was, but he used to draw a metaphorical line on a postage, you know, and he had yeah. used to put a circle on one side, a circle on the other side. He used to say, uh, in this conversation, do you want me to give you an answer or do you want me to ask questions? Now that's, uh, what do we call what do we call that again in the less community a false dichotomy is it it's like it's like where it's between one option or the other but it was quite clever nonetheless because no matter what they answered you know he either had permission to advise or he had permission to coach it was a bit cheeky but uh, uh sometimes we should just be listening we should just be observing and um yeah i, I hope that helps justin but that's the that's whole idea with it it does but just not to steal the show i just have one question to ask on the back of yeah. that yeah, because I know your feelings are retrospective, so now I'm quite the same that the, the whole team can do them, and I can just, as a scrum master, you can just sit back and you know watch the show. Yeah, I guess from what you're saying is this is why some scrum masters love the retrospective because they like saying this is my chance to to coach for an hour and a half. You know what more in mind, what what went well, and by the way, let's talk about this. Is that oh, your okay. kind of way to bookend some coaching? Uh, okay to, i to i hear you yeah. yeah so the the retrospective like you're talking about scrum here i think right about retrospectives right so uh, there's a sprint retrospective in scrum and for me it's probably the only gig a scrum master has because uh, i hope the product owner is doing topic one of sprint planning and the developers the product owner are looking after topic two the developers are going after topic three i hope the developers look after the daily scrum and i hope the product owners are going after the sprint review that's just my personal preference for action. And maybe the only gig that a Scrum Master has in terms of facilitation in a good team, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, if the team is falling into chaos, you should step in and facilitate as, as requested or as needed. But I just hope you're never requested and never needed is the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, but even then, the, the team could take turns running the retrospective. Uh, but you have to be careful as well because um, sometimes what can happen is facilitators try to manipulate the audience by setting the agenda and what you also need to do as well even with the retrospective you need to be tuning into what uh, issues the team feels uh, they have in front of them but also the retrospective is probably the area where you've got permission to kind of show the mirror a little bit in terms of this is what you've observed as well as a scrum team member so because you're part of the team too where it gets a bit tricky is having the facilitator stance and being part of the team at the same time is kind of a tricky for me. So sometimes I might say, Andre, uh, I, I'd like to take off my facilitator half a minute. Would you mind taking the facilitator for a minute? And he does, he takes the hat and I then participate as a, as a team member. So I have a say, and then I put my facilitator hat back on. And so when you're facilitating, you have to be careful that you're not kind of uh, shoehorning your agenda into the team. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky balance. It's just my opinion, uh, Justin. I'd love to. I'd love to hear what other people think here as well about that. Uh, if anyone else has an opinion on that, I can add up on that. So sometimes when I feel an urge to actually be that nasty guy who reflects to the team what what, what I have observed, I am just not my master to be the facilitator. To be an external facilitator to the event. Yeah, and it helps. Then I can just focus on being a scrum team member with my observations over there. And I have another person who is brilliant in facilitation who is helping me with that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. And the other thing, you just need to make sure is the psychological safety there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's kind of like the devil, you know, isn't it? Sometimes as well, but it's a tricky one. So Justin, it's it feels to me like from what you're saying it's like there's a whole coaching conversation and by the way you can submit a question to me to the daily flow and i'm happy to deal with it that way there as well if you want to dig in even more 
but it feels to me like you feel like something needs to be said and it's not been said. And so my, my sense is you should say that as a scrum team member and maybe take Andrew's tip about asking another person to come in to facilitate uh, to see if you can just get your voice because you're a scrum team member like anybody else, I'm assuming, in that case. Yeah, good advice, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? You're done with executive agility now. I had enough of executive agility. Maybe while we're, we are waiting for questions, I have just uh, one thing I noticed. And what I noticed, John, is actually uh, the self-awareness that you have. So you clearly know the aspects in which you're good at. You clearly know the aspects in which maybe it's not your strongest side and you're yeah. okay with that, right? Yeah. And right when you know in which aspects you're good at, in which aspects you still need to improve yourself, or you just don't have this ability. For example, I have, I don't have a lot of abilities I wish I would have, right? You just know how to play it. And this is... I'm sure you awesome. do, Andre. But let's, yeah. but, you can, but, you, but thank you for reminding me of something because sometimes there might be a peer, my an Artem knows some of my peers, for example, and some peers have strengths where I'm not so strong. And sometimes I can just feed them with the content. So sometimes it might not be me having the conversation with the executive, it might be me feeding them with these sets of deletions that might need to happen. And this is why. And then, you know, as long as I'm in the same way, the same wavelength with that person, that person can use their influencing skills to maybe make progress where I can't make that progress. Not because I'm a bad coach or anything, but maybe there's some dynamic there that maybe I've, I've had in one client, for example, just because I talk to teams, it means I'm not important enough to talk to an executive. That actually happened to one of my clients. Uh, whereas another guy was smart enough to come in and say, well, actually, I don't do retrospectives of teams. I work at the executive level. And now he, he, was, at the, he was at the table. He had a seat at the table then because that was the culture in that particular organization. And what I would hope then is that colleagues like that would, would try to lean on me where I'm strong so we can basically leverage both our strengths, essentially. Thank you, Andrew, for bringing that up. That's kind of it, really. So any, any wrap-up questions, any comments? Anyone surprised by anything that I've said this evening? I love the bit you said about retrospectives again with, with executives. So if I'm putting it back to executive, what you've been talking about, I love yeah. that bit, what Les does. So I want to look into that. And by the way, um, you just reminded me that um, I love Les. I'm a Les Friendly Scrum trainer. I wouldn't bring less up when there when there's uh, when people are in output land. If they're if they're still in the place where they think they can just squeeze more juice out of the teams, I won't even bring the subject up. I'll I'll inform the conversation with the principals from less, uh, but I need some deletions to happen. Uh, that, that's at least how I deal with it. Uh, before I'll even bring up stuff like uh, some of the stuff because some of the stuff on less you've probably noticed is quite advanced in that presentation this evening. And so the executive probably isn't going to be listening to anything that I'm saying. Uh, but if you're more brilliant than me, you can you can do that. And there are people who, who do that and they do it very well. Thank you very much. Okay. I believe this is it. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, thank you, John. It was cool. Uh, uh, follow John on LinkedIn. Uh, with the uh, morning talks that John has also subscribe to John's podcast a lot of valuable information over there personally a listener so wouldn't recommend if uh, I wouldn't uh, I would listen yep and thank you for being with us so tomorrow we also have an awesome guest tomorrow will be and the day after yeah and the day and after the day after so, day after tomorrow so this week we have six six presentations scheduled but wow. what we can promise to you, what we can promise to you, from next week we will be going live uh, less often. Week after because that. Because we feel it's, yeah, may maybe maybe it's too much. Week after that, yeah, maybe it's too much. Even for us. <laughs> no, for us it's not. <laughs> but maybe maybe for you guys it's too much. But yeah, the week after the next one, uh, we won't have the meetups every day, but we're gonna have, uh, I believe, two meetups a week for European audience and two meetups per week for our American, uh, American audience. It will happen uh, a bit later on, but stay tuned. Tomorrow there's going to be one more awesome meetup. 
And thanks yeah. again, John. And remember to donate. Remember to donate. Yeah. Stop recording and it's time for stupid jokes. Yeah. See ya.